also want to thank the organizers. It's been a fantastic meeting. It's really uh, great. I think it's, uh, we should all come back for uh, the next uh, few. So what my uh, laboratory focuses on is how to take the many different kinds of high throughput data that are available now and try to develop integrated models that really help us advance uh, biology and also particularly try to find therapeutic insights. Uh, we've heard a lot already about uh, technologies for measuring uh, expression of genes, originally arrays, then uh, uh, RNA-seq, um, and some of, uh, recently about uh, chip-seq technologies measuring protein-DNA interactions. There are also a huge number of technologies now for measuring protein-protein interactions, using mass spectrometry and other techniques for measuring post-translational modifications of proteins, uh, screens of various kinds to measure the effects of chemicals uh, or single gene knockout or knockdown, and also uh, measuring metabolites. So we have all these very quantitative readouts of what's going on inside cells, but of course we need to find computational ways to turn that into something that actually gives us uh, real insight that can lead uh, to therapeutic strategies. So what I'm going to do in this talk in the first part is lay out some of the challenges that we face when we try to do that kind of integration, and then I'll show you the approaches that we've taken uh, to solving them. So the first challenge that people uh, encountered when they tried to make sense of high throughput data, these transcriptomic, proteomic, all these omic technologies, uh, is that when you think you know what's going on in a biological system and you do a systematic measurement of what changes in response to that perturbation, say you hit the uh, mating pheromone pathway in yeast, uh, or in this case uh, you perturb the EGF signaling pathway in mammalian cells, typically what you find is that 90% of the data don't fall in the expected pathway and a good chunk of the data don't fall in any annotated pathway. And so this clearly presents a challenge for how you interpret those data. You can't simply paint your data onto known pathways and hope to get uh, an understanding of what's going on. But it also presents a huge opportunity, because if the expected biology is really only 10% of what we measure, then we can discover a lot more about what's really going on, and perhaps that'll get us further in trying to develop those uh, therapeutic strategies. So this first challenge is that the uh, most omic data don't uh, lie in known pathways. That um, uh, is one challenge, but even more serious challenge is what happens when you apply more than one of these omic technologies to exactly the same problem. So imagine that you have some cell and you expose it to a DNA damaging agent and you measure which genes change in expression, and then you simultaneously measure which genes when knocked out or knocked down affect the viability of the cells in response to that DNA damaging agent. You'll find Venn diagrams of the overlap of those things. It looks something like this approximately no overlap, and usually, uh, even, if when, even if there is, it's not statistically significant. That's not more than you would expect by chance. So the pessimistic view of this is that each one of these omic technologies is so noisy that that's why you don't get anything significant in the overlap between the different technologies. But we know that's not the case because each technology independently is highly reproducible. And so it must be that they have some sort of inherent bias that leads you to different sets of genes. And I should say that it's not just different lists of genes, but usually the categories of genes that you get from gene ontology are also completely different. So what we think about then when you think about uh, interpreting this in the context of the cell is that each of these technologies is measuring something different. We need to understand what it is that they're, that they're measuring. But if we were able to understand the true biological pathway with some sort of cartoon of imagine some signaling pathway that starts at the cell surface and initiates signal transduction cascades that reach the nucleus, and then some other uh, aspects that are taking place in the cytoplasm. And if you were to paint every protein and gene with a different color based on what experiment detected it, you would see something like this, where there aren't any proteins, or there are very few proteins that get more than one color. Um, but there are pathways that consist of proteins that were detected, some of them by mass spec, and some of them by genetic screens, and genes that were changing in expression. And so one of the goals of these network approaches, then, is to make sense of why you're getting disparate answers from all these different technologies by finding this integrative approach, the one that can identify these pathways. And I should stress these are probably unknown pathways, ones that are not available in CAG or Ingenuity or something else like that. And a second related point is that if you look at these uh, maps uh, in reality, you'll see that there are lots of proteins on known signaling pathways that we don't detect. So even on the known pathways, we're missing things. So we want to then use these approaches to find some of these hidden proteins, the ones now indicated in red, that are part of these same biological processes, but were not detected directly in any of our experiments. And so we need to adjust how we think about omic data to go from just mapping it onto known pathways or trying to use multiple techniques and looking at the tiny bit of overlap between them uh, to understand them and really focus more on the network approach. And so uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll try to tell you how we think about applying network approaches uh, to these data.
the first thing we're going to do is the point I've already made, that we're going to try to find the physical connections among all of these data. And that might reveal to us signaling pathways and other kinds of biological processes that we didn't already know about. But if we use naive network approaches, we very quickly get networks that look like this, uh, what we would lovingly call a hairball. And these hairballs really haven't uh, told you anything you didn't already know. You knew the problem was complex. You've taken a relatively small set of proteins and genes that you ident identified in different omic assays, and now you've increased it by, I don't know, a factor of three, a factor of 10, uh, and now you have a much more complicated problem. So we need to use advanced network algorithms to avoid getting these hairball diagrams and get uh, diagrams networks that allow us to actually design experiments, because that's ultimately the goal. So these are the first two important points I want you to uh, take away, that uh, we believe network models are the way to integrate these data, but we cannot um, make any use of just hairball diagrams. But the third important point um, is what we do with the vast abundance of transcriptional data that's in the literature. So it's very easy, very cheap to do uh, microarrays or RNA-seq now on your uh, system of interest. And what do you make of those uh, genes that are changing expression? Well, for a long time, it was popular to view that as a, just a sort of noisy proxy of what was happening to protein levels. And so you map what gene ontology categories are changing in expression and take this indication that the biochemical pathways uh, were changing uh, in expression well as the, at the protein level. But in fact, careful studies now have shown that that's a really, really bad assumption to make. Uh, this plot shows protein expression levels on the y-axis, mRNA le expression levels on the x-axis. You can see there is a crude correlation. There's an R squared of 0.2. But more importantly, at any particular value of the RNA levels, you can get a three order of magnitude variation in protein levels. And so it's not going to be very useful to take our mRNA data and use those as estimates for protein levels. Instead, what we need to do is use them as evidence of the upstream signaling pathways. So if there's a change in the mRNA, there must have been some change either in the binding or the activity of the regulatory proteins uh, near that gene. And we heard about some uh, well, ways of approaching that in the previous talk. And so part of our problem is then to identify these DNA binding proteins. And I'll show you ways to do that using uh, binding data and sequence analysis uh, to try to leverage a limited amount of data to find out information about unknown DNA binding proteins. And then once we've converted our mRNA data into evidence of the upstream signaling pathways, then we can try to reconstruct the rest of those signaling pathways by integrating other kinds of data. And in particular, we're going to use protein-protein interactions to find the links among, these, uh, among the pits from our various omic assays. So we're going to use physical interactions from the interactome. So those are the high-level approaches that uh, I wanted to get out. And now I'll tell you about a specific project that was done by Carol Huang, who was a graduate student in my lab at the time, and she recently started a postdoc at the Salk Institute. And Carol focused her analysis on the study of glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is an extremely devastating brain tumor that's usually discovered at a late stage. Patients come in with nonspecific symptoms. Uh, eventually, the right scans are done, the tumor is detected. Standard of care is surgical resection followed by chemotherapy. But invariably, these tumors recur, and most patients will not survive much beyond a year after diagnosis. And so this is the sort of biological problem where you hope that maybe all the omic technologies that we have can bring new insights and really have some effect on human health, because all the standard approaches have failed up until now. Now, we started by focusing on a specific aspect of glioblastoma uh, biology, which is focusing on one of the mutations that occurs very commonly in glioblastoma, and high levels of which are correlated with the worst outcomes for these patients. This mutation is called the EGFR variant 3 mutation, or EGFR-V3. EGFR is a protein that sits on the cell's surface and detects the presence of the EGF ligand. And when it binds EGF, it initiates uh, uh, phosphorylation events through its tyrosine kinase activity. The mutation alters the activity of this kinase to make it uh, constitutively active at a low level. So there's a fundamental difference in the signaling between proteins that have the wild-type EGFR and proteins that have the V3 mutation. So we started by analyzing fossil proteomic data that had been collected by a collaborator of ours at MIT, Forrest White, and they used a mass spec-based technology to detect peptides that had tyrosine phosphorylation on them. In cells uh, from tumors, a cell line der derived from these glioblastoma tumors that either were expressing high levels of this V3 mutation, or they were expressing an EGFR uh, protein that is incapable of phosphorylating anything. It has an inactive kinase. And so by looking at the differences between cells that have a high level of uh, V3 mutation and the inactive kinase, you can hopefully discover what the underlying signaling pathway is. We added to those phosphoproteomic data gene expression data, um, and now we need to figure out how to incorporate those two together. And remember, I told you that we want to use the gene expression data as evidence of the upstream signaling pathways. 
So we need to way, find a way to identify the key transcription factors that were all, uh, changing their activity in the V3-containing cells versus uh, the wild-type cells. And the approach we took uh, to doing that is uh, using an experiment called DNA's hypersensitivity, followed by massively parallel sequencing, or DNA-seq. And in the short time I have, I can't take you through the details of that experiment, but I want to explain at a high level what it does. It identifies regions of the genome where there are transcription factors bound without having to know anything about what those transcription factors are. So it's a genome-wide technology, and it works for all or almost all transcription factors as far as we can tell. And so when you're done doing this DNA-seq experiment, you have sites at which you detected hypersensitivity indicated by these arrows that will surround sites where there were proteins that were bound, but you don't know the identity of the protein. But now we can use those sequences uh, using motif discovery to come up with good guesses as to what those DNA, uh, DNA binding regulatory proteins were. And more specifically, what Carol did was she collected this DNA seq data in cells with the V3 mutation, and she also collected it in cells that had the inactive kinase. And then she searched for sequence motifs in regions that were differentially hypersensitive, so they were hypersensitive in one cell type and not the other. And that gives you a set of transcription factors that are potential regulators. And she narrowed that list down further by using a regression-based approach, where she asked whether the strength of the motif was correlated with the strength of the expression change. And using this univariate regression, then, she's able to associate with every transcription factor a probability that it actually was regulating the genes uh, in, this, uh, in these two cell lines. So she collected, uh, as I said, hypersensitivity data in, um, in both the uh, cells expressing the V3 mutant and the inactive kinase. Uh, and then she went from having about 600 transcription factors that were all equally probable, you might think, uh, as binding to, um, uh, sorry, motifs, to having 185 motifs. And for each of those motifs, she had the probability that it was likely to be regulatory. So now we have all the pieces we need to put together this map of what's going on in these tumor cells. We have uh, expression data, protein-DNA interaction data, protein-protein interaction data, and the post-translational modifications. So how do we do it? Well, first, we're, as I said, we're going to use protein, physical protein-protein interactions. Um, there's a lot of this available in databases. The last time I downloaded it, it was about a quarter of a million protein-protein interactions known in humans. So that's good news. The bad news is that these vary a lot in their uh, reliability. Some are extremely high confidence interactions, some are lower confidence interactions. And if you take your data and you, um, and you try to map it into, into the interactome, you very quickly end up with, again, these hairball diagrams. And that's because you have false positives in your uh, original data, the transcription factors that we predicted, the proteins that were changing in phosphorylation, and you also have a lot of false positives and false negatives in the interactome. And combine those lead to just one of these increasingly large and hairy uh, networks. So to overcome this, we need to do two things. First, we need to take into account that the interactome is not, uh, consi does not consist of protein, uh, protein interactions of equal reliability, but we can, should assign a probability to every interaction, our confidence that it's true. And secondly, most importantly, we need to find algorithms that allow us to only connect some of the data to each other, not everything. Because when you try to connect everything, you get the hairball. So assigning probabilities turns out to be a solved problem. There are very nice approaches that have been published uh, for quite a while now to use Bayesian technologies to look into those databases for every interaction, look up what its underlying data were, uh, and then assign the probability this interaction is true based on our confidence in the underlying technology. So you can do that in a totally automated way for the quarter of a million interactions uh, and now know the p-value of every interaction. Uh, the second challenge of how to only connect some data turns out to be harder, and what we uh, chose to do here was use thing called the prize collecting Steiner tree approach. So the core idea in the prize collecting Steiner tree I'll show uh, with a little piece of this hairball diagram. So in this little uh, piece of the hairball, I've shown in yellow the proteins that are changing in phosphorylation, uh, the boxes in the genes that are changing in expression, and the triangles uh, will be transcription factors. And I want my algorithm to try to find um, some piece of this that includes a lot of the data that are easy con to connect with high confidence interactions, but decides not to include some points because it's hard to connect them with high confidence interactions. So the algorithm needs to decide, does it include an outlier like this? Um, does it have enough confidence or not? And the way to do that, um, it can be expressed in just a very simple objective function uh, shown at the bottom. I'll take you through the two terms. The first term involves assigning prizes to every node in the network. And we assign a prize to node and network based on our confidence that it really was changing in the experiments that we conducted. So uh, a if a protein is, str is strongly changing the phosphoproteomic data, it gets a big prize. If it's marginal, it gets a small prize. Proteins for which we have no experimental data get no prize. 
And the algorithm gets to keep the prize every time it includes that node in the network indicated by the heavier lines. It gets no prize for the nodes that it leaves out of the network. And of course, it gets no prize for the nodes for which it had no experimental data. And we asked the algorithm to leave behind as few prizes as possible. Um, but that in itself would just give us back to the hairball. So we balance that desire to collect as many prizes as possible with the fact that the algorithm has to pay a cost for every edge that it uses. And that cost is based on the probability. If it's a very probable interaction, it's cheap. If it's an un- improbable interaction, we have very low confidence at protein-protein interaction, then it's an expensive edge. And so by jointly um, optimizing the number of prizes uh, and the cost, you can uh, end up with compact networks. And so then the algorithm will decide, is it worth it to include this uh, node? It will if this is a high confidence node. It changed uh, significantly in the phosphoproteomic data, and the edges are high confidence, and it won't if those conditions are not met. And so with this prize collecting standard tree approach, we can go from having hairball networks that might contain thousands of nearest neighbors of our hits to this network, which is actually what Carol obtained for the glioblastoma data. And here, the nodes that have uh, prizes associated with them have red outlines. The boxes are ones that change in phosphoproteomic data. The triangles are the transcription factors that we inferred by combining uh, the expression data and the epigenomic data from the DNA seq. And so uh, I won't take you through this in great detail, but you can see pathways that make a lot of sense in terms of the MAP kinase cascade, PI3 kinase. You see P53, which you'd expect. We did also a lot of statistical tests on these networks. For example, we asked whether the network is recovering proteins that have been previously associated with the glioblastoma. Um, uh, There was another study of phosphoproteomic data in glioblastoma that was published very recently. We were able to show that our network captures a statistically significant fraction of those. And perhaps uh, somewhat shocking to me, actually, that the transcription factors that we were able to identify purely from the cell line data actually do a good job of explaining expression changes in the cancer genome atlas between patients who have the V3 mutation and patients uh, who have glioblastoma but don't have the V3 mutation. In the last few minutes, what I want to take you through are some of the uh, experiments that we did to validate these networks. So one of the nodes that shows up in our network um, as connecting a bunch of transcription factors to upstream signaling is this protein P300, which um, the eagle-eyed among you will have seen on some of the previous slides in the last session. So P300 is a protein that is a transcriptional regulator but doesn't directly bind DNA. It's recruited by DNA-binding proteins. And that's what the algorithm is using it for. It says, OK, it connects to a bunch of these triangles that we inferred. Um, and so it makes sense that it would be in the network. But on the other hand, P300 is also a very sticky protein. It has many, many known protein-protein interactions. It's a hub protein. And so there's a certain risk that the algorithm is just including it because it needed some way to connect all these transcription factors to the rest of the phosphoproteomic data. Um, so how do we know that this isn't just there because it's a hub protein? So what we did was we immunoprecipitated P300 and we mapped its uh, positions to the uh, genome. And then we asked whether those sites where P300 were bound were sites that were changing in their hypersensitivity uh, between cells that have the V3 mutation and the wild type. And sure enough, we found a very strong statistical association of P300 binding sites with sites that are uh, changing in hypersensitivity between these cell lines. So it's not just there because it's sticky. It's actually at sites where there is transcriptional regulation going on between these two different cell types. And if we look in detail at the uh, sets of genes with with which P300 is associated in these ChIP-seq data, we find pathways that make a lot of sense. The epithelial mesenchymal transformation, which you heard about yesterday, which is associated with uh, glioblastoma development. Uh, The uh, neuronal differentiation, which is a process that's blocked in the process of glioblastoma development. So all this made sense. But the real uh, important question for us is whether these networks could actually guide experiments that might lead us to better therapies for glioblastoma. And so what we did here was we ranked every node in the interactome by whether it was within our network, it would be very highly ranked, if it was very close to our network, uh, or whether it was far removed. And then we selected nodes from our network and from these other uh, high-ranked nodes and and low-ranked nodes, uh, found ones for which there were commercially available compounds, and then asked whether treating cells uh, from glioblastoma with uh, compounds that target these proteins has an effect on the growth of the cells. And so on the top here, I show you uh, data for the highest of our uh, uh, ranked of our targets, the ones that are very tightly uh, in our network. At the bottom, we've taken lower ranked targets. It's still all above a third of the interactome, but they're lower ranked. And what you can see is uh, the viability of these cells is shown on the y-axis and different compounds um, and different graphs. And you can see that at the same dose, uh, you do much better in blocking the growth of these tumor cells when you go after the nodes that came from our network or very closely associated with the network than the nodes that are further removed. Now, some of these nodes are actually very surprising. In fact, uh, one of these was so surprising that I uh, tried to convince Carol not to actually do the experiment. 
she found that estrogen receptor is one of the highest ranked nodes in her network. Uh, it was ranked 15 out of the entire interactome. And it was put in the network not because it binds to DNA, uh, although it does, but it was put in the network through its protein-protein interactions. So it was a little bit dubious that this was uh, uh, at all relevant. I tried to convince her to work on other things, but she was stubborn, which is a good thing. Um, and she measured whether hitting these cells with tamoxifen blocked the growth of these tumor cells. And sure enough, it did. And in fact, it blocked the growth of the tumor cells that have the V3 mutation uh, much more effectively than the control ones. And in fact, that's a trend that we see. Uh, in cases where we're able to fit the data uh, to multiparametric curves, we find uh, a significant difference in the LD50 for the compounds that are uh, highest ranked, and we find much uh, less significant. Only one case did we find significance in the LD50 for the lower ranked targets. And uh, one final thing on, the, on these chemical screens, that in some cases we're actually able to find synergy among the compounds, so that uh, hitting the, the, uh, the cells with uh, a combination of these compounds, in this case the EGFR inhibitor and HSP90 inhibitor, does better than you'd expect uh, from the individual treatments. So in the last few minutes, I just want to tell you about some advances we've made recently in the lab on these algorithms. Uh, this is work that was done by Nurjan Tunshbag, and some of this was, uh, was uh, stuff that she presented in the last RECOM conference. And the idea here is to try to build richer network structures. So we've been working right now with prize collecting Steiner trees. It's a tree because all the nodes have a single path to each other. But of course, real biology is not made up of trees. It's made up of often independent signaling pathways that have some very difficult to discern connection amongst them. And so Nurjan, uh, with some of our collaborators, has developed a very efficient way of discovering prize collecting Steiner forests. Uh, and you can read about the details of that algorithm in her recon paper. And then she's also uh, used methods for valuing statistical significance of any of the nodes that we detect. For example, that P300 protein that's sticky, how often do we get it in random networks? And so she can very rigorously assess the statistical significance of those sticky nodes. And so now, um, and she's also been working with mouse xenograph data, so we've gone from just cell line models to uh, mouse models um, of the tumors that are being propagated in mice. And so now we can get um, networks that look like this, where we can see multiple independent pathways uh, that are going on in these cells. Uh, the nodes are colored by how confident we are, so the dark red nodes are pathways that are very unlikely to occur by chance in these networks. And we can detect things like TOR casca signaling cascade in some cases, or uh, glutamate signaling pathways over here. And there are some nodes that are white because they're, um, they're highly likely to occur just by chance, including the EGF receptor itself, which in this case is really occurring. It is the mutation that causes uh, these changes in the glioblastoma cells, but we would have picked it up by chance anyway. And the last uh, thing I wanted to say about uh, this kind of approach, then, is because we can do this in individual tumors, then we can do this analysis for many different patients. And we can actually identify, then, compounds that might be effective for many patients. It would be indicated as red over here. Uh, we have patients in rows and in columns or different uh, potential targets uh, versus targets that might only be effective for a couple of patients. And so we believe that this is a way that uh, ultimately could be quite useful uh, for uh, if not personalized medicine, is at least slightly more uh, targeted uh, therapeutic approaches. So I'm going to sum up now with some of the high-level points that I hope I've conveyed to you. The first is that when we think about these omic technologies, we have to think about them as much more than lists of genes. We have to think about them in the network context, because each technology is telling us something different about what's going on in the cell. And we're going to get different answers depending on which technology we apply. And that these network models do have the capacity to assemble all these data and find the hidden connections amongst them. Now, I also wanted to uh, try to put these kinds of interactive models in the context of other kinds of modeling approaches that uh, you may have heard about here. So this graph uh, shows on the axis of uh, whether the modeling approaches discover physical relationships or statistical relationships, and whether they work with uh, systems of known components or unknown components. So all of you are probably very familiar with regression-based approaches, mutual information-based approaches, which are extremely powerful because then we can work with systems of completely unknown components. We take genome-wide data, and we can find associations among those uh, proteins and genes. Uh, that's the good part. The bad part is that those are purely statistical associations. In some cases, they're direct. In some cases, they're very indirect. And you can't uh, discern the, uh, that uh, at the outset. At the other end of the spectrum are things like differential equation-based models, which are fantastic for small systems. Uh, where you know all the components, and they can directly model the physical relationships, but they're not applicable yet on the genome-wide scale. And so these interactive models live uh, somewhere in between, where they're very powerful for systems of unknown components, but uh, provide us with physical uh, network models. And a final point in relationship to other kinds of modeling, then, is because the interactive models uh, don't require uh, huge data sets to, uh, to identify covariation, 
they are applicable to individual tumors as well as being applicable to uh, hundreds of uh, patients. So in the long term, how I see things playing out is that we can use these um, highly unbiased approaches, systematic measurement of what goes on in cells, to build models that help us find the physical relationships among proteins. But we're still not all the way there, because in the examples that I showed you, we went after uh, various compounds in the cell uh, in our network, sorry, various nodes in our networks and hit them with compounds, but we didn't know whether those nodes should be activated, activated or repressed. So we need to ultimately get back to um, more uh, computable models, differential equation-based approaches, Boolean logic, uh, and other approaches like that. So with that, I'd just like to uh, thank some of the key people involved. I mentioned uh, Carol already and Nurjan, who are directly involved in work, and here some of the other members of my lab who've been working on this. Uh, we benefit a lot from fantastic collaborations at MIT, uh, and also with uh, Jennifer Chess and Christian Berg and Microsoft Research and Ricardo Zakina at the Polytechnico of uh, Turin. So. Questions? Hi, it was a very interesting talk. I had uh, one question regarding like normalization of your cost for edges versus your um, let's say prizes for nodes, because normalization of those like scores affects on how many nodes it's gonna select versus how many edges it's gonna use to like connect them, and it might affect on like output of the algorithm on like how you normalize those scores. I think. So, so you're wondering. absolutely right. The, um, the, the, relative, uh, uh, the relative amount of weight that you give to uh, the, no, the prizes and the edge costs is going to affect the size of the network. So we have a tunable parameter in there. Mm. When we first started doing this, we basically tuned it to a point at which we thought we could carry out experiments. So we tried to get networks that were reasonable in size. Mm -hmm. And now we've been working more with um, randomization-based approaches to try to find the setting in which we get the most significant networks. And we think that's going to be a more successful approach. I may have asked you this question before in one of the meetings, in which case you will know why I work in Alzheimer's in my lab. Uh, but the, <laughs> but so, the, so the question is, uh, there is no such thing as a glioma cell line with an activating mutation EGFR. So how did you, so you, you study specifically what are the things that are induced by EGFR activating mutations, but how, and, and so the validation that you did with the drug was done in what context? That was, again, in these same cell lines, the ones that have the V3 expressing uh, version of the EGFR versus the inactive kinase version of the EGFR. Oh, so these are instrumented by, by these are cell lines that are produced by, by your lab? That, uh, we receive them from others, yeah, but we use the okay. same cell lines, okay. exactly. Right, right. Uh, now we've been moving to the xenograph, so there the validations are actually going to be a lot harder by taking longer. So. Yes? Great talk. So I have a question about the network model that you have. So in the Steiner 3 model, so there is no loop and therefore there is no feedback. Have you thought about how you can basically use the same idea but basically including letting the algorithm to find some loops and feedbacks in the system? Absolutely. It's a very good question. So what we've been doing actually is taking the Steiner uh, trees and forests and focusing primarily on the nodes that they return and then restoring all the edges uh, that were in the interactome still in a weighted way. And so if, uh, in the actual pictures of the network, you'll see that there are all sorts of, uh, of cycles uh, in these graphs, and we think that's probably a more realistic way to do it. Um, so, yes. All right. Hi. So um, these networks, you you're using them to produce ranked lists of genes, but have you also looked at um, the relational information that a network provides? And I'm wondering how you would evaluate that. So we, we haven't done enough in that direction. I think that's um, what I was trying to get at in some of these uh, last slides. I think ultimately what we need to do is take these networks and use them to narrow down the world of possibilities, the set of proteins and genes we want to work on, and then apply other kinds of modeling approaches. So this is not going to solve all the world's problems, but it does take us from having to work at the genome-wide level down to something that is amenable to differential equation-based approaches or logic-based models. Hi, Ernest. Hi, Great Karen. talk. <laughs> uh, your Steiner tree algorithm made me think of a video game, but um, yeah, that was <laughs> well, my question. We'll discuss that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you went quickly through a slide on synergy among the drugs, and right before that you talked about finding the, the best drug targets. I'm wondering if you can or have tried to find drugs that would work in synergy based on your Steiner trees and based on the algorithm that you presented before it. So I'll give you the same answer I gave to the woman who preceded you, which is I think that the real way to do that is to try to get from these models to something that's more computable. 
that um, I don't think the network properties by themselves are going to be sufficient to do that, at least not in a very accurate way. In terms of finding, like, oh, here's a drug that targets this part of the network, and here's a drug that tar <coughs> targets another part of the network, um, and therefore they might synergize better than something that targets the same. So I, I think one, one can try to do that, but I think you'd be better off with actually computable models where you can test, you know, what the effects of all the feedback loops are on that, because there'll be very non-intuitive results, I would sure. imagine. Sorry. So uh, I, I like the way you put um, Boolean logic into perspective. I work on Boolean analysis, <laughs> but uh, my question is not on Boolean, but uh, I was trying to... Um, so you mentioned P300 protein, and most people, I, I think we heard in this uh, meeting, uh, talking about P300 in the context of um, enhancers and uh, general proteins, uh, do you think it's like a general thing or very specific functions in any of these? So uh, there are strong genetic data that indicate that the amount of P300 in the cell is quite limiting. Uh, there's something called the haploinsufficiency syndrome when a patient has only one functional allele of CBP, for example, which is a close relative of P300, and they have broad developmental defects. So there isn't a lot of P300 or CBP around in the cell, and it's getting recruited to specific sites, so it's not everywhere. It's not like polymerase. Um, but it does seem to be involved in a lot of different uh, biological processes, and so that's what makes studying it hard, I think. Okay, so let's thank Ernest.